If you have a business, you've probably heard you should use publicity, media, and public relations to build brand awareness and grow your business. Whether you're a business owner or not, you probably always wondered, how do talk shows, podcasts, blogs, TV, news, radio, how do they pick their guests? And hey, maybe there's even a piece of you that's thought, maybe it could be me, and then instantly got an imposter syndrome and forgotten about it. Full disclosure, I know I definitely have. Maybe your mentor has told you to become a thought leader to differentiate yourself, but you're not sure where to start, what you have to share, or how to do that. Publicity, media, and public relations can be a game changer for your personal brand. Whether you're a professional, entrepreneur, it can be a game changer for your business and your career if you know how to land it and leverage it. But so many people, especially women, get stuck. They underestimate their credibility and decide not to put themselves out there. Women tend to think of themselves as nobodies, or they look at where they want to be and determine where they are now isn't good enough, and so they wait. I say women because I don't think men struggle with this as much. So many of the women I know and work with, and heck, even myself, we tend to make ourselves small. We minimize our story, our experience, and our expertise. Women are taught to fit in, to not rock the boat, or we'll get judged, and as a result, we end up people-pleasing. We live in fear of standing out, afraid that people won't like us. Again, my hand is way up here and I am guilty as charged. The impact of this? I mean, you already know some of these things. We already know that women don't apply for jobs and ask for promotions and raises as much as men do. Female-run businesses don't raise capital as much as men do. But in the PR world too, it's also making a difference because women aren't applying for awards, they're not applying to be experts, and as a result, their brands, whether it's a personal brand or a business, aren't getting the exposure, growth, and credibility they deserve. That's a big deal because when women don't get credibility and don't get credit, don't get publicity, they're not visible and they miss out on opportunities. Their businesses and careers get limited and this extends their ability to create generational wealth too, something that you know we're passionate about here. On a bigger scale, our world suffers because we don't get to see women as role models as much as we should, and we miss out on the inspiration and role models we deserve. But it's not all hopeless. In fact, there's never been a better time to get visible and step into the spotlight. Today, I'm so honored to be joined by one of my friends, Almira Bardai. And she's not just a friend though, she's also one of North America's leading brand experts in brand building and communications. Almira is a fierce, powerful, brilliant woman, and she's here to help women see themselves as worthy, get more visible, and get the publicity they deserve. Also, just so you know, there is some swearing in this episode, so if you have little ears around, put on some headphones or listen to this episode later. In this episode, we get both tactical and mindset and spiritual all about PR. You're going to learn a lot about PR, the tactics, what publicity and PR is, including some ideas and opportunities you may not have thought of, and some of the things that are evolving in our constantly changing world. You're going to hear why it's so important to be visible and what the benefits of PR are. PR are. Hmm, fun. (laughs) You're going to hear why it's important to build your publicity, even if you're in a corporate job or you're a professional. Almir shares how to plant the seeds of PR now and not just wait till someday. This is really important and you'll hear why. You're going to learn about why thought leadership is important to establish and not just that it's important, but also how to do it. You're going to hear about paid media, what it is, if it's worth it, and what to consider before you pay for publicity. We break down the difference between cold and warm pitches, give you suggestions on what to write in your emails and key phrases, as talk about how much time you should dedicate to PR as well. Probably most importantly, we talk about the importance of finding your unique angle, and you're going to learn how to differentiate yourself from others. Believe me, if you're here listening, you already are unique and different and your thoughts are so worthy and need to be heard. Almira and I also talk about spirituality, mindset, and energy, all how it relates to PR, including how manifestation and feminine energy play into publicity, the great awakening, and how you can integrate more feminine energy into your life. By the end of this episode, you'll be ready to put your hand up, to step into the spotlight, and remember that you and your story are worthy of being shared. You'll be ready to speak, to share your voice, build connections, send pitches, and have the media calling you. I know that you're going to walk away from this episode feeling confident, important, and powerful, all things that you already are. And you'll feel inspired to take that confidence and power and go take action on your PR journey. 
So listen into this episode with Amira Bardai about public relations, feminine visibility, and thought leadership. Enjoy. Welcome to the Golden Girls Podcast, where we believe you can have it all. I'm your host, Lisa Michaud, and I'm spilling tangible tips, goal-getting strategies, and real-life stories to inspire you to tackle your biggest dreams. You're a woman who knows you're made for more. Get ready to leave the excuses and self-doubt behind by being vulnerable, sharing your truth, and having honest conversations so you can succeed on your terms. Together, we'll set goals you'll actually achieve by staying motivated, having fun, and building a community of women empowering women. It's time to tap into your best self, get confident, and truly have it all. Golden Girl, let's dive in. Hey there, Golden Girls. Welcome to this episode of our podcast with Almira Bardai. Almira is one of North America's leading experts in brand building and communication. She has spent the last two decades, and I know she says this makes her sound old, but I think it makes her sound really incredible. She spent two decades creating powerful narratives for both domestic and global brands like Flight Center, Granville Island Brewing, Nike, Best Buy, Future Shop, Molson, and Telus. Almira is a huge advocate for leadership in business, and she's been recognized as one. She's a recipient of multiple awards, including Enterprising Woman Magazine's Women of the Year Award, Profit in Canada Business W100, Canada's Top Female Entrepreneur, Business of Vancouver Top 40 Under 40 winner, and the finalist of the Vancouver YMCA Women of Distinction Awards. Super impressive. And I cannot wait to hear more about these awards, Almira. Um, On top of that, Almira also co-founded and was co-CEO of Jive PR and Digital, one of Canada's top boutique PR and social media agencies with offices in Toronto, Los Angeles, and Vancouver. She is a thought leader on issues affecting the PR industry, appearing as a commentator in the media, and she's an actively sought out speaker on both PR and entrepreneurial topics. Elmira is driven by a passionate desire to see women rise up, both personally and professionally, and to eradicate inequality at all levels. I know you're going to hear that from her, and this is what she's here to serve up to us today. So Elmira, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm so excited about the conversation that we're going to have. And you're also just amazing. So anybody listening to this podcast, you're always in for a treat with Lisa. Oh, thank you. The feeling is so mutual. So today we're going to talk tactical and spiritual about Mm -hmm. public relations, publicity, and I'm going to bring a bit of a feminine lens to this. Uh, But let's get tactical first. For someone who Mm -hmm. might be new, and I know you have some different ideas on this, what is PR and publicity? Um, What is it? Who should be getting it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to start with where it started, because I think if you you start at the grassroots of it, people begin to understand a little bit more. So as I say, back in the old days, it was about getting into radio, TV and print being newspapers. And it was about pitching your story to get into the media or having an event, whatever it might be, that was something that was newsworthy enough to get the media to cover it. But with the changing of the media landscape, things going more digital, and then also, to be perfectly honest to you, about uh, media consumption changing, people are not buying newspapers, younger people are not reading them, but we're consuming content online. Uh, You've got influencers, you've got social media, like the whole landscape has changed you now have when you talk about PR, public relations itself, you're talking about radio, TV, print and online, online being blogs. And also to a certain degree, you are under the umbrella of PR is influencers. Um, Not always, you know, we still get some clients who say, I just want um, strictly PR. So it is radio, TV, print and online and podcasts, of course, so important. And then the other scope of it, like I said, is influencers, perhaps it includes social media. So there are agencies who will run social media networks or publicists would do that for you. Um, And of course, there's PR agencies and there's independent contract contractors being publicists. That is what a public public that that is what a publicist does is get the clients into the media. And, you know, of course, when we think about publicity, we think about celebrity culture, right? The Kardashians. And they are great at publicity. But that's not all what it is, is all the fluff and the red carpets and things like that. You know, there are hard stories out there. There's new stories out there or behind um, perhaps a strike, right? If there's any strike action, there's usually uh, communications or PR people behind the management of it on either side, managing the narrative to the media. So the short end of this long description is, is that it is working with the media to get your story out there and then also looking at the types of digital networks that exist. 
To add another component to the mix, there's also paid PR, which is actually really interesting. So you can work with an outlet to pay for a story. And what I love about that is you're getting a journalist to write the story and you get to work with them in creating the narrative. It's still really newsworthy. Um, but it, particularly for something like a profile, if you are an amazing entrepreneur, but you don't necessarily have a very newsworthy story, but you have a great story to tell, paid um, PR, especially given that... Um, we don't have a lot of new uh, media outlets here in Canada, but also, I mean, it's, it's worldwide that you can do paid editorial, but you can get your really great story out using paid editorial. And I really enjoy doing it. Oh my gosh. Really cool. I love how you described it there about you know getting your story out there because that makes it seem like it reminds us that we all have a story. We may not all have a red carpet or a Kardashian money or team, but we all have a story. So yep. why do you think PR is so important? Like who should be getting it and what are some of the benefits of it? Yeah, I do think that all companies, um, again, it has to be the right type of a company, you know, necessarily a manufacturing company, although it would be very interesting to their own industry to read about this company. But depending on who your audience, any audience who d works with consumers um, should be looking at PR and also, you know, coaches. I think in this time and age when there's, you know, coaching industry really is one of the hottest things out there. Or you've got some coaches who are some of the, the top entrepreneurs, right? You're looking at like an Amy Porterfield, for an example, or a Vishen Lakhani from Mind Valley. Press is super important for these individuals, for these entrepreneurs, for these leaders. And even from a corporate perspective, if you are, I don't know, a director of uh, DEI, or director of something environmental within a corporate organization. I do think that those are important because it establishes you as a thought leader, which again is so much, is such an important piece of the PR puzzle. Um, again, opportunities for celeb PR, it is what it is, but on the flip side of it, there's such an opportunity for brand development, both as companies and as the CEO or the, the leader of an organization. And then of course, thought leadership opportunities, again, for the CEO, but for an individual person, um, really setting them up as an expert in their area. Um, and I mean, that's actually how Ryan Holmes from Hootsuite actually became a thought leader, is not because he was talking about Hootsuite, but because he started to talk about remote work his thoughts on remote work, uh, he got a ton of coverage about Hootsuite's offices. None of it was actually related to Hootsuite. It was all about Ryan's thoughts as an expert in this space, as an expert in the tech industry. And the PR was done specifically to set him up as a leader. The Hootsuite PR was just like the icing on the cake, but that was never the intention when starting to do PR for Ryan. And I can say this because I actually know the publicist who did all the work, but the intention in getting Ryan out there was actually not talking about Hootsuite. It was talking about what his views were and his thoughts were as a tech leader. And that is such an um, available opportunity for any expert out there, frankly. Mm, I think that's fantastic. I love that you frame that as both an individual and a corporation thing. And mm -hmm. for some people, both, like for Ryan Holmes, obviously there's an element of both in there. Um, for some people, it might just be your company or for some people, maybe your, your personal side. So I love that you said that. Why do you think it's so necessary and in particular for women to be visible, to take at, to get their story out there? Why does this matter? Because we are experts. And for such a long time, the media has turned to experts who tend to be men. It's really that simple. You know, the people who've been reached out to for commentary, or it, it tends to be because they're looking to speak with the president or sweet seat or C suite it is a man. You know, there haven't been women in leadership positions, or usually the publicist is a woman behind the scenes, right? Getting the guy onto there. But our role models and our entrepreneurs and our C-suite, our CEOs have been men. And even as coaches, right? How many male coaches get more ink than the female coaches. It's about um, evening out that gender balance. Women need to be role models. You know, we, are, we look at each other, right? And seeing what a woman is up to, or we start to spark and catalyze ideas for younger women. I know a number of women who are like, oh, you're so brave. You're an entrepreneur. And I was like, well, actually, I ended up as an entrepreneur because I couldn't get a job when I moved back to Canada, which is a whole other story because Canada really does not recognize international experience. But they say, you know, it was so brave of you. And if it, even again, I didn't go into entrepreneurship because that's what I thought about doing. I literally had no choice. But if I can be a role model for bravery and what a woman can accomplish, that is why we need to be more visible, right? And being able to speak our minds. I think for so long, we've been told that we're too much. 
or we are women are, um, you know, in the manager ranks. They're not necessarily a director level or the, the C-suite. And so we need to show other women that it's possible, you know, much like Sheryl Sandberg did with Lean In. It was about showing the opportunities that are possible or that you could balance work and home life, right? We just, we're, we're women. We look at each other. We have community. We talk. And so it's one, it's about saying, I am here for interview. I am an expert. Hey, media, look at me see what I have to say. And you know, they talk about like the divine feminine in leadership now, and how feminine is coming into leadership. And it's not so much about women learning from men, you know, because and it used to be about like women were trying to be men, the shoulder pads, right? Like the, the hard rock hair. But now male leaders are actually looking at women and their leadership. And that's coming into the boardroom. So again, if that if we are going to be the role models, we need to be visible enough for the media to come to find us. And you know, media are so busy. They're just going to go to their list of experts they've already spoken to. And like, I'm still on some, um, uh, so the TV media, and I mean all media, but TV media in particular, keep a list of experts to call on. And I'm the publicist for a number of experts. I haven't even worked with them in 10 years, but they'll still call to reuse that same list. We need to get women onto that list to be called up, to be recognized. Because again, media just go to their same old lists. And until we start saying, hey, I'm here ready for interview, you know, you reach out to the media. And that's exactly what PR is, reaching out to the media to tell them about you and you're available for interview and your thoughts. And, you know, we can get more into the tactics of how you actually get in front of the media. But until we start putting up our own hands, they're not going to find us and they're not going to come to us. And so we need to continue doing that and getting more and more women out there. And particularly in this time of history, they want to talk to women, They especially want to talk to women of color, but they want to talk to women. Put your hand out there, ladies time for interviews, it's time to be visible. Yes. I love that. I mean, I think and you and I have talked about this, like women, we are afraid to put ourselves out there. Sometimes we, you know, women don't think that they're experts there. I mean, Cheryl Sandberg did a great job. I think of pioneering a lot of that around lean in, but it's true. I mean, the statistics are wild. Like a man will apply for a job if he's got, I don't, I'm making these up a little bit, but he's got 10 or 20% of the qualifications and a woman has to have 90% of them. And mm -hmm. so I'm sure that translates to publicity as well. You look at it and you think, well, I'm not where I want to be or I'm not yep. the biggest yep. expert out there. And so we don't put our name out there. Um, and so I love, you know, I just love everything that you said there. And I think it's just as much, the same things we see in terms of women not getting promoted, women maybe not starting businesses at the same rate, or as we talked about in the venture capitalism episode with Yuri Fulmer, um, women not getting capital raised as much, also women not being in the media. So I love that your mission is to to change us. Actually, I don't know if that's your mission, but I just made it yours. I hope that's okay. No, you know what? And it, it has to be. So when you think about all of, and listen, I don't want to make it seem like the, the it's stacked against us, but men generally are provided with more opportunities. It's the nature of the world or you know, and I'll, uh, I've even seen it working in my companies where one of the guys would ask for a raise and he was quoting a higher number automatically than the girls were. They just do. You know, they have that level of confidence where they apply for the job. Whereas we women have this massive sense of perfection. You know, we want to tick off every box and maybe it comes to people pleasing because we want to please the recruiter or please the hiring manager that we wait until we've ticked off every box and we then hold ourselves back from those opportunities. So we literally need to go out there and any fear that we might have, fear of being judged, fear of being shamed, fear of standing out, right? You know, like we've all been in that experience in high school. And, you know, again, you and I've talked about there, there's so much talk out there about humanity and consciousness rising through this time of I still call it COVID. Am I allowed to still call it this time as COVID? No, um, let's let that go. No. I know. <laughs> I'm so over it. I'm so over it. Back to real life. But it changed human consciousness. And so it is about, you know, like letting go of all those wounds. And and it, what is that quote? Um, your fears, sorry, your desires are bigger than your fears. That's what it is. And so letting go of fear of being judged or again, going back to that point in high school when, you know, you stepped out and then the mean girls were there shaming you for having stepped outside of the box or the category that you were put in or for trying to be visible. And, you know, we, you get labeled, oh, the loser is doing that or the brown girl is trying to be cool. You know, there's so many labels that come out of those situations. And it's just being like, you know what? I love to swear on this. 
Go for it. We'll put a disclaimer. Great. You know, fuck it. <laughs> fuck all the garbage, right? I mean, as we all know, there should be a disclaimer with me in general. Um, but like, fuck it and fuck all the garbage. That takes a lot of courage to do that though, right? Because to a certain degree, we've just been um, ingrained, socially ingrained that we have these feelings or this shame that we all carry. And it's like, it's got to stop. Because the longer that we try and be people pleasers, the only people who are suffering are women. And it just, it has to stop. What kind of role models are we for our children, for our daughters, for our sons? You know, there's a reason why I'm a boy mom is because I also needed to understand the boy experience behind it. It's, it's a whole different bag of worms and a, and a different way of the world that we need to be showing up as women. Otherwise, what example or what change are we creating for the less privileged women of the world? Of course, you and I, again, you and I talked about this. North American women are so privileged, so privileged. And what are we doing to change the world or to change the way of life for women in other countries? It starts with us. Absolutely. You know, you talked about the mean girls in high school, but I just want to also call it for those of us who high school was a while ago. Uh, it's it's still hot. This and I'm going to call it toxic femininity is pre so prevalent in social media. I mean, all the time you see women tearing each other down and can't, I mean, cancel culture, I believe, and different than, you know, kind of, or accountability or, you know, working through um, challenges in a way that is empowering for everybody, but specifically cancel culture tears people down and people just get on board with it. And it, it really is, I think, um, another example of when, if you step out, or if you do something that other people don't like, mm -hmm you're going to get called down. And so I think a lot of, I, I know a lot of people are terrified of cancel culture these days. Mm -hmm. And so while it may not be the mean girls in, in the hall at school saying something to you, or it may not be being discluded at something at, you know, in high school, mm -hmm. it's like visceral and it can attack mm -hmm. your, your family, your friends, your yeah. livelihood, your business, your work. And so, yeah, I, I definitely still, I think that that fear there's a reason why it still exists for women, why we're yeah. so afraid to step yeah. out. And it's also why we have to go into within ourselves and tap into that divine feminine and, and build on our expertise, our confidence, what we have to give to the world and be humble enough to admit when we make mistakes, cause we're going to make them and keep going and let that be okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's so crazy how we went from a history of many, many years, like thousands of years ago, where women were a tribe and witches, right? You know, healers, and we were all working together. And then all of a sudden, it turned into this shaming culture. And, you know, particularly us, uh, in society that women are, are second class citizens in some countries, or even like, you know, if I feel like I'm allowed to say this because I am South Asian, um, and that their shaming of girls or not wanting the daughters or the mother-in-laws treat their daughter-in-laws horribly. And um, I'm Northern Indian. I'm not Punjabi. And I only say this because there's a lot of talk about these types of situations in the Punjabi community here. So that's all to say that I'm an observer of this. I'm not, I haven't actually experienced it. Um, but you look at these, at our types of cultures that we have in our society where there continues to be shaming of girls or there continues to be situations where the older woman will shame the younger one because, you know, she has been taught that it's appropriate to do this or that men treat women again as second class citizens. <laughs> How did our society get to this, right? And these are even more about the reasons why women need, successful women need to be visible. You know, one of my favorite stories is actually, it's about an entrepreneur from Afghanistan. And she, because the Taliban didn't actually say that women couldn't work. They just couldn't work outside of the home. And so she ran school and her businesses inside the home, which is how she managed to get away with it, and is one of Afghanistan's top female entrepreneurs. In fact, she's one of the top entrepreneurs. The book is called... Um, the uh, dressmaker of Karakana. And if we can get more and more of these, those stories out there, and one, we do it from our perspective, but then as we start to get more publicity or we can help another woman in other countries rise up or introduce her to a book publisher, do all of those things, that we can all go back to those times when we all supported each other. Because Karen has to go. Karen's got to go, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Karen's I love the go. Karen memes. Yeah, I love the Karen memes. They're amazing. But the fact that that stuff is actually real, it's shitty. Absolutely. Hey, I want to ask you about, you know, 
awards. You've obviously won a lot of them. And I know I, I've never thought about this, but you say that, oh, I've heard you say that awards are actually another example of publicity and same with speaking engagements. Can you just speak briefly to the award piece? Because you know, you're talking about this idea of successful women and highlighting them like awards are, and speaking engagements. Those are two things that uh, we're underrepresented in. And I think there's some massive opportunities there. Totally. Yeah. And so I was a YWC Women of Distinction finalist in entrepreneurship category. And that year, we actually had a number of other uh, finalists in that category. But I remember looking at it years afterwards, and there might have been three, maybe five finalists. And whether or not it was a question of women who didn't necessarily qualify for, you know, meet the criteria. But my perspective, and from what I've heard, is, is that there are also not enough women applying in certain categories. Like the sciences category, there's always been a number of women, but they work in corporate jobs. So typically, you're getting the PR department who is nominating these women. Um, but whether or not they're saying, I want to be nominated, or they're being voluntold, half the time when I am um, looking at, for awards opportunities just among my entrepreneur friends, I'm like, I'm literally sending the email. I'm like, who's applying for this? And I volunteer, I voluntold so many of them. Um, but I will actually work with these women in writing their package because they're also so modest. You know, they don't, they minimize themselves. So they're like, oh, that accomplishment was because of the team effort. Really? Because you were part of the team. Could you please step up and own your accomplishment and your contribution to that piece? And I think women are not, we're, we don't give ourselves permission to accept the credit. Even if it was team credit, I don't care. Take credit for your part in it, right? And, you know, when you think about an award, so if you're a finalist, the organization does PR on all of the finalists. And then if you win, they do more PR for you. And you even get to use in your bio, on your website, in your LinkedIn, in any speaking agents. I mean, you introduced me talking about my awards. It establishes credibility, authority, expertise. And as a coach, if there are if any coaches are listening, you get to charge premium prices. Who wouldn't want to do that, right? It is that credibility and that visibility and the third party acknowledgement of your um, of your achievements. And we have to stop uh, minimizing ourselves or saying, oh, you know, I'm not that important or I don't think I'm good enough to win an award. Like the whole not good enough thing is just mind blowing. And, you know, I say to these women, I'm like, are you running a multimillion dollar business that you founded? Well, yes, I am. I'm sorry. How does that not make you eligible for an award? Right automatically given your achievements you should be doing this or well you know when they write the award application the narrative is horrible it is it doesn't tell an interesting story it doesn't talk about their achievements you know it, it no wonder that women are there's or sorry no wonder there's more male finalists than female finalists again not to minimize men's accomplishments but i wonder how the application or the nomination was even written right Mm -hmm. Are they telling their stories? Are they telling their stories of growth or challenges or whatever it might be? You know, you, you can speak to the financial numbers and tell all those good stories or talk about leading your team. You know, there's, there's so much opportunity. And again, going back to why you need to do an award again, you need to apply for awards to talk about your accomplishment, to be able to get that award, to get the PR out of it, but also because you deserve it as women. Do we have a sense of worth and deserving? I don't know about that. You know, we say we do, but do we really? Otherwise, you'd be seeing a heck of a lot more women, in my perspective, applying for being the finalists of the awards. And I love how there's a category for, I don't know, maybe it's a tech award, like women of the year, women of the year. Well, there shouldn't have to be a woman of the year, but at least it does recognize that there is a category for women specifically to be recognized, right? I feel like this is a good invitation to everybody listening right now to make it a goal that this year you apply for one award yeah. maybe two i don't know let's say two yes let's, let's put that yeah. invitation out there i i challenge every person listening right now every woman every man every human listening p apply for one or two awards i think that's really i think that's something that's really overlooked and clearly an amazing opportunity and i love that you you put the roi right in there like you can charge higher prices if you have that Establish credibility. Yeah. Fantastic. I and love that. Especially as women, what is one of the things that we tend to do? Volunteer. Every community has volunteer of the year awards. 
how do you get nominated for that? Right. You may not be an entrepreneur. So my point goes to, you may not be an entrepreneur. So you couldn't apply for entrepreneur of the year, right? You're not an entrepreneur, but what is it in your community? Or there's also the courage to come back awards, which are amazing. And it's, I think it's usually around a mental health challenge, actually it might be mental health and physical challenge. But my point is that there's a number of awards. There's startup awards in the technology community, right? So what about the, the, te- the, the startup awards or small business BC has a, immigrant award, new new, uh, immigrant business or something like there's categories upon categories. So there's no such thing as not being good enough. There are opportunities. You just need to Google for them, right? It literally is that. You got a year, you got a year to Google and apply for two. I love that. Okay. So you you touched on this. I I think there is a misconception that this is all for entrepreneurs And, and granted you're an entrepreneur. We've been talking about entrepreneurship, but I believe, and I and I think you're going to back me up on this, that this is not just for entrepreneurs and influencers. This is actually super important, uh, even if you're in a corporate role. Why do you think it's important if you're in a corporate role to still do PR? Yeah. And to not just, by the way, not just to say, I'm hoping that my PR team or my communications team at work will do this, but why is it important to step up and own your career in that way? Yeah for women, we have to own our careers. And, you know, I hate to say it, but I'm still seeing situations where a woman is passed up for promotion because she went on that leave, you know, hopefully an organization, first of all, would never do it. But if they do, they would think twice about uh, doing it to a woman who's had media coverage or an award-winning entrepreneur, right? It's, perception and its perspective but within an organization and just because you're in one corporate business right now like you might be changing a job right so when you go on to the next job if you've won an award you get to ask for money you don't even get to ask for more money you get to say i'm worth it because i've won these awards it's the foundation that you're standing on right so you who stays at a job for more than two years realistically these days um as a contractor also, because of course, a lot of people will go from a corporate job to a consultant. As a consultant contractor, you get to charge more money. Automatically, based on my reputation, I get to charge double. Like when people reach out to me, like I'm a minimum $8,000 a month, you know, like I just, I one, I've got all of the years of industry knowledge and all the expertise. Second of all, I've been recognized with all of these awards. So automatically, I've got that credibility. And again, the knowledge that you know, as a woman, I had to do a lot of work around my own worth because, and I think I was trying to trade off my expertise in number of years, but okay. Obviously you get to charge more because you've been in the industry for a long time, but I also get to charge more because I'm an amazing person or I'm an amazing entrepreneur. I think that's another piece about going back to women's worth is, is that we're always looking for something to determine our value, that external validation that says, yep, check, you're allowed to, because you've done this, check, you're allowed to charge more money. Yeah, but what if you're just really awesome at your job? You get, or your service, if you're a service-based um, business or consultant. No, actually, you are so fucking good at what you do that you get to charge more. It's that simple. But of course, the, the awards or speaking ops or media opportunities allows you to continue to enhance those. You know, this goes back to generational wealth. You're all about talking about wealth and money, Lisa. You know about all of this stuff is that the more that we can continue, women continue to generate money, it's not just about the money. Money is amazing, but it's about the life that you get to have. Is it about um, getting to hire that assistant so you're not working 60 hours a week? What does your future look like? Do you want to continue working like to, to the grave? Nobody wants to do that. What does retirement look like and, and what age? And especially, you know, men, women uh, outlive their partners. So what happens then? Or a woman gets divorced at 60. What does that look like? You know, how are we stopping our own selves from generating wealth if we're not going out there and looking for opportunities to be visible? Like, it's a whole different story. Oh, I love your passion for for women and creating opportunities for women so that women can change their lives and change the world. I, I love that. Thank you so much. Thanks for saying that. And I, I totally agree. Like, for me, I think none of us are in jobs for very long and your job is going to change. Your boss is going to change. The company might change. The industry might be completely turned upside down. You're the constant. And when you can build up your profile, your, I mean, I didn't do this when I was a corporate world job externally. I did it internally. Um, but I wish I had known about this externally because this would have been even more incredible. It would have given me more time. And I think that that kind of leads me to what I want to talk to you about, because I've heard you say you need to plant the seeds of PR. What does that mean? And why does it matter, you know, to plant seeds 
before you have the multi-million dollar company or before you, for example, are the CEO or in the C-suite, why is it important to start planting seeds today, AKA your call to action to start planting, yeah. planting seeds? Yeah. Just like you would do from a networking perspective for a job, right? It's like in a couple of years, we think about changing jobs. You're going to start networking and meeting those people. And so just like PR, it takes time to land those stories and to land that coverage. And when you've landed, say your dream is to be CEO of a major firm. Great. It finally happens. And you're 35, which still makes you young, but you're not a hotshot 25 year old. Well, you may not be as newsworthy, like that you're an automatic yes from the media. However, if you had been getting uh, media coverage or interviews or awards, whatever it might be before you landed that story, it is so much easier to pitch it to media. Like I said, any, it, like anything, there's an education um, process behind it. So when I take on a new client, for example, it typically takes three months in order to get some media coverage because you're educating the media about your client, what they can speak to. Like in my pitch, we, we send email pitches to them. We'll say, you know, this topic. So one of my clients is a cybersecurity company. Obviously, cybersecurity is a hot issue right now, but I still need to pitch him because they've never heard of him before. And I'll have some bullet points about what he can speak to. And they might pass on it the first month or say, I'll add it to my expert roster. Great. Next campaign comes up next month. We're going to pitch them again and we're going to continue to educate the media. At this point, they've now seen three emails from me talking about my client and the topics that he could speak to. So they're starting to register it, right? That's the education process. And so if nobody's heard, heard or you, you haven't achieved anything, again, you're facing that three months. But what if you've done a whole bunch of coverage before? So that by the time that you or, or awards are speaking on, so that by the time that you do land that CEO role, that your PR people are calling and the story ends up being about this hot coup that um, was scored by this company and getting you as the president, right? You literally have to think about it as the trajectory of your career and your profile. So doing the legwork, like anything, doing the legwork in advance. And again, like I say, not to say that somebody who's 35 is old, but you're not necessarily going to get the headline like a 25 year old CEO would, right? So what is it that you're building and what is it the visibility that you're doing? So you're not having to start from uh, square one from that time that you get that, that seat. And also like there's a lot of awards, you know, uh, 30 under 30, or there are awards where they're looking for people in their twenties and stuff who are doing good for the world apply for those. Those are amazing. You know, there's even the made in Vancouver awards where they look for the best handcrafted products. Amazing. And you know what that drives sales when people read about you in the magazine, and you're one of the hottest products and you win an award, of course, they're going to buy from you. That's what you want to it's brand awareness. And and you know, when you I talk about the actual ROI of PR, you can never con um, connect PR and the hard sale that somebody read this story and they bought it. Like, you know, when clients come to us and they're like, oh, I want you to guarantee sales. I'm like, no, you know, buy an ad because you can track it, right? Put a UTM code on your digital um, display ad and then you can actually track it, right? That that sale went there. You can't do that with PR. But it goes to the larger piece about brand awareness. And when people know about your brand as an individual or your brand as a C-suite or as a director or your brand as a company, and they keep seeing that. Or your brand is a professional because you still that. have a brand. Yeah. Everyone's got exactly. a brand. Yeah. We all have brands. Absolutely. You know, and that's also about like going back to, what is it? Recruiters will check your Facebook and your Instagram. You don't want to commit career limiting moves on social media when you're trying to get your dream job. It is your brand. What does your social media reflect of you, right? Mm -hmm. And so having the integrity and the intentionality behind it and getting those right stories and looking at those opportunities are so key. It's about brand you. You know, what life do you want to live? You want to live a life of big dreams and you need good money. And how are you going to do that? By being visible and by showing your expertise. And that fundamentally, like it, it negotiates your salary, right? Or how much you can charge if you're working individually with a client. It reminds me of that, uh, the quote that like, by the time you need a network, it's too late to build one. I yeah. feel like that also relates to publicity and PR the way you're describing it. By the time you you need it, it's too late to start building those relationships. So start building them now, start pitching yourself now, start start building building your profile. I think this is a really good segue to talking tactically about thought leadership. What is thought leadership? We know it, I think you're gonna tell us it's really important. I believe it's important. But how do you go about establishing thought leadership as well? 
Yeah. One of my favorite ones, uh, I was about to say one of my favorite mediums is medium, but there's too many mediums in there. But medium, I think also really um, democratized it. I feel like podcasts have democratized uh, media because anybody can have a podcast. And so long as you have great guests, people will listen. Um, and then um, d- d- writing on medium, just your thoughts. And it has to be well written, right? There's blogs and whatever that you can learn about what is, a, a, how do you write a great story or how to write a great article. And then you could put, you know, write that on, in your thoughts and post it to LinkedIn. And you could even write it on LinkedIn, but it's shorter. And so if you've got more to say, then you can do it on Medium and you can have your thoughts out there. It gives you more Google juice so people can find you. You know, think about it going from an unknown consultant who has no Google juice whatsoever. And then somebody searches you and manages to find a whole bunch of articles with your thoughts and things like that, right? That's what we're doing. We're all Googling anyways. So what are you putting out there? Or if you are a consultant uh, having a blog where you wouldn't necessarily put your personal thoughts on your own company blog. It's not necessarily meant to do that. So if you want to do something from a more personalized perspective, you can do it on Medium. Um, And for me, one of my girlfriends, she loves to amplify everybody's content. So I'd written a piece for Medium, which actually got picked up by Medium um, and they ran it, but she put it on her own LinkedIn and it got thousands of views. So I was like, thanks for being my publicist, Jen. Much appreciate this, right? But women looking to um, lift each other up, share each other's content. But those are exactly like if you're passionate about something, talk about it. Absolutely talk about it. We are all having these conversations right now. And we're in a time of history where there's so much shit happening in the world. I hope you have an opinion on something. Put it on Instagram. You know, you've been very vocal on your Instagram and that is your platform to do it. You know, don't waste these opportunities. We're in the time when the world is having these conversations or having the hard conversations. You know, there's so much stuff happening in the world that whatever, you know, you anger you might have or you want to vent it, do it appropriately on a digital platform and, and let your voice out. But if you're really passionate about, you know, and you want to be on somebody's podcast, well, think about well, how could you be interviewed on there? What do you have to say that's interesting? And then put yourself to the podcast. And that's something else that you get to have some Google juice attached to you. That's how you become the thought leader. You, know, you can also um, uh, do paid opportunities in Entrepreneur Magazine and in uh, Forbes. There's the Forbes councils where you can write articles. That's another way to do it as an entrepreneur. Uh, being in one of those councils or in the paid opportunities, um, those are really great ways to do it. And then again, you get to share it across all of your, your social networks and your digital networks. There's media want to hear different perspectives they're always looking for really really great stories so if you can write that great content because that's what it is right to a degree like pr is content marketing so if you've got the right ideas just turn it into a piece of content what about speaking engagements do they count as thought leadership Yep, 100%. I think you can speak more to it uh, because you do so many more speaking engagements than I do. But again, when you and I were were, uh, talking about this podcast in advance, you were saying that this is where you shine is on stage. And I think for some people might be a challenge to do a speaking engagement um, or even I am like, what am I going to say? You know, why did they even ask me to speak? I think that's also where we as women minimize ourselves and we minimize our stories. Or I think there's a certain element of, well, I'm a woman who's not had the amazing career that these male CEOs or audience members have had. So like, what do I have to teach about? Well, actually a lot. And from the human interest perspective, um, learning about the challenges in life or mindset, I mean, mindset's such a, a big thing right now, but how do you even talk about things from a feminine perspective, right? What about talking you know, men talk mindset? What about as a woman talking heart set? And maybe it's talking about um, divine qualities to leadership. I think men would love that. And I, I think we need to stop judging men that oh, men are not going to want to listen to this. I think they're actually super fascinated and interested. So what is it at the core of your essence and what you have to say that would be of interest? They wouldn't be asking you to speak if you don't have something interesting to say. So, and then also, like you said, you shine on stages. That's where you get so much of your business. Business, And I think that's another piece of it is, is that where do you get so much of your business? My businesses are all uh, built on referrals. And so I work my network continually. I don't think, I mean, I don't do a lot of speaking, definitely not as much as you do, but I don't think I've learned anything from speaking opportunities. Mine has really been about referrals or being an event where somebody referred me to somebody else or clients who referred us to someone else. That's where my businesses are built. 
Mm. Okay, you're gonna be so excited. I like. I want to go out and go start pit, do some more pitching and speaking. And yes. and I feel like anybody listening is gonna be so fired up and ready and feel like yes, I can do this. And yes, my message is important. And I am an expert and and ready to own their power. So I, I love that. I'm so grateful already for that, Almira. Um, okay, last tact or last couple tactical questions before we we switch gears here and go a little more spiritual. You've talked just now about the human interest side and story. What do you mean by that? What do you mean when you say media is story? And do you have an example of that? Yeah. I mean, I tend to think about it from a news perspective where sometimes you'll have a really amazing news story, but they're covering a dog who's lost somewhere. Like, are you kidding me? Right? Like they love those stories that go after someone's heart or pulls on heartstrings. Where is your human interest story within your life that it could be relevant? And I think this is more particularly for podcasts because now the news media to a certain degree has been so decimated. They they don't even have enough reporters to be able to cover the the stories that are out there. So from a podcast perspective, I mean, what this episode is probably going to be about an hour. And so you and I are talking about my story and giving valuable advice, but you reached out to me because of my story and my thoughts. So you're setting me up as a thought leader. You're a thought leader as well. And you're putting yourself out on social media. But then we also talk about um, our stories. And, you know, I've told you about this before. One of my favorite podcast episodes of Golden Girls is you and Troy talking about investing. And you talk about your story and how you did it. That's where people learn. That's where you share your expertise. So what is it within your story that you can talk about how you grew something? Or um, I think I've done two podcast interviews about my exit from my previous business with my business partner, how I did the exit. And that ended up being a fascinating conversation. So again, going back to your own story, what is it that's interesting or unique or that others are not talking about? Or how did you overcome a challenge? Um, One of my favorite articles was about, it was in a Canadian um, business publication, and it was talking about a CEO who had bipolar. And I thought that was fascinating. Because, you know, there's so much stigma around having bipolar, um, mental health issues, and how they just, I guess, survive as CEO, if you will. Um, But it was just, it was such a fascinating story. So again, there's so many issues that are up for discussion on the table right now. I mean, we've gone through COVID, we've gone through um, uh, Black Lives Matter, we've gone through Me Too, we're talking about women's leadership, like there's so many issues out there. What is it in your story that media would want to talk about? And so the way that you would actually tactically pitch them is is that if you find a reporter who's talked about an entrepreneur who's had a similar story than you, perhaps, you would never email the reporter and say, you know, oh, I saw that really great story in that entrepreneur. I have exactly the same story. Next time you want this interview, I'd love to do it. Well, no, they're not going to call you because they've already covered that story. So the way that you would make that pitch is, you know, hi there, saw that story. I thought it was fascinating. If you're ever covering a similar topic, this is my perspective on it, or these are the challenges that I've experienced, particularly if your maybe your solutions were different to that challenge. So, you know, I experienced the same thing. This is the, the three ways that I, um, I tackled it. And then you put your bullet points of the three ways that you tackle it. You have to show something different and unique. It's like anything. What's your USP? What's the USP in your story? Or what is different if the story has already been written? And I know that um, there was a lot of talk about, it was another tech company. Was it, oh my gosh, I can't even remember. Um, But that CEO was an American guy and he had major bipolar. Like everybody literally thought he was crazy, but then he started to write the articles and to start to talk about it. And even though, you know, other people have talked about it before, everybody glommed onto it because he talked about the tactics that he did and blah, blah, blah. So going back to it is, is that what's your point of differentiation, even if a story has already been done? We're all unique human beings and different people, right? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I mean, I think it even goes back to like this podcast. I mean, there's millions, I would say, podcast episodes out there about publicity and media and pitching and this is what makes this different is that it's you and it's me and we're talking about tactical and we're going to talk about spiritual stuff too so it is like what's the unique angle here how do we what what do we have to say that's different and i think a lot of people get hung up on that because it is kind of hard because we've all been taught to be the same that conformity Mm -hmm. is um conformity is what's taught in our in our society in our culture it's what's rewarded and so there is a it is really hard i think to to look at it from what makes you different but once you start to 
think about your story, your experiences, how you show up to things differently. The things that maybe you didn't like about yourself in high school, they're probably your gifts, right? Mm -hmm. The things that tried to get stomped out of you that you maybe got in trouble for as a kid, being too loud, talking too much, whatever that is. Those are probably your gifts. Um, and you can use them to, to be your unique angle and to, to differentiate mm -hmm. yourself. Okay, totally. let's take this into mindset, energy, and spirituality. Um, there is a lot of lack energy out there. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of comparison, you know, when it comes to comparing your lives with influencers or Kardashians or other entrepreneurs or, or other people that are higher up in an organization than you. How do you ignore that noise and stop the comparison and stop this mm -hmm. lack energy? Oh my gosh, it is a daily practice. And I didn't realize to what degree I had lack energy. I think turning, gosh, I'm like holding onto the table as I say it. I'm turning 45 this year. And life not being exactly what I thought it would be. You know, I think I thought at 40, I would sell my business, have a bigger exit. I'd be traveling more. Um, don't get me wrong. I love what I do and I love consulting. But I think I thought I would take a year or two off because my exit would be bigger. And so there's some days I'm like, I'm still schlepping it, right? Well, these are learning lessons. Get over yourself and, you know, stop checking out those Instagram accounts. Like there's that fine line between having the visionary Instagram accounts. There's one. <laughs> if these are uh, uh, agents in Montecito, California, and so they're posting stunning mansions that are anywhere from 8 million to 62 million, right? And I'm always just like, what have I done wrong with my life? How come I'm 45 years old? What's going on? And then it's like, calm the fuck down. Seriously, like count your blessings. And I think it's just about having that practice, that gratitude practice, taking that step back. I'm really, really grateful for my life. You know, I get to live in Richmond, which yeah, fine. It's not the thriving metropolis of Richmond, but it's safe. You know, I don't have to worry that Russia's going to invade Richmond. Well, knock on wood, right? I get to send my child to school in peace. I have an adorable child who, like, he's just, he's the light of everybody's life. I'm so blessed with my child. He was a complete monkey who calls me by my first name, which I just did not expect he would do that when he was two and it's been nonstop. But, like, I have this amazing house. I am safe. I have food in my belly. Again, it goes back to the really, really simple gratitudes of life. And there was a coach that I was working about and she, working with, and she was talking about the moment. And so in those moments, yes, I might see me something on Instagram that it feels like there's a knife going through my heart, but really, what it what do I have in the moment? How am I winning the moment? How am I owning the moment? And COVID has really taught people that you only have one life to live and how short life is and how unexpectedly things happen. And we didn't expect the world to shut down. Like I felt I felt so unprepared that even though there was all this stuff happening in Asia and Italy got shut down and it was just like but everything just happened so fast and all of a sudden we were locked down. What? Like what, what's going on? And I think that taught us the value of every single day. It's not about the value of the year. It's about the value of a moment and what the day. So that's my personal practice because otherwise it would be such a mind fuck about the, the, the lack energy. And for me, it goes back to like, what are the simple things in life that, that make life so enjoyable? And what is it that I do have? That was my way of doing it. And, you know, a lot of coaches talk about that as well, that, you know, it's the simple things in life or, you know, your health, you just, you don't have anything until you have your health, right? Oh, preach that. Yeah. That's for sure. Are there yeah. any particular mantras that you use or maybe would recommend to women when it comes to this PR thing? Because I think a lot of that comparison a lot can come up when it comes to getting ready to pitch themselves. Yeah. What are some of the mantras or, um, I guess, reminders that you'd give to women and yeah. what, what mindset should they be taking on yeah. as they're going to pitch themselves? Yeah. Literally, as you sit down at your computer, not, and even before you open up the email, you sit down and say, they want me, they want me. And when I sit down and write that email, like I'm energetic, it is, it is literally a head game. And I even see this in younger PR people. And this happened to me too. Like you'll just be pitching. You've got a client, you're pitching and pitching and it's crickets. The media are not responding and it is devastating to young publicists because they see their older colleagues who are able to get those stories and they're just like, I suck, but it's actually not the media's job to respond to you. Like, and especially like anything we talked about, um, that the prep time or the education time media have to learn your name and see you getting used to you and in your inbox and stuff. So again, it's such a head game. 
And one of the things that we used to teach uh, when we used to teach our coordinators, the, the junior PR people, when they would join, we would teach them how to pitch. We got those bouncy trampolines. And so we'd be up there and teaching them to jump and bounce. And that's how Lindsay, my former business partner, would actually get into that energy of that excited, that strong, that confident, and also like the endorphins are going into your head because you're jumping on that bouncy trampoline, right? And she's like, and I'm getting an ass workout. This is amazing. I'm killing all the birds with one stone. But the way that I sign off my pitch emails is please let me know your availability for interview. It's not, if you're interested in the interview, please let me know. If you would like an interview, what do you mean if? Of course they want to interview you. Please let me know your availability to interview me. And I do this for all my clients. Please let me know your availability to interview X, Y, and Z about cybersecurity. You know, I'll reinforce it. Put things in bold wherever you need to. But it's that energy of acting. I mean, we talk about it all the time, acting as if. But it's the energy of saying, yes, they want me. Because not responding is like, what are you doing here? For them, your self-esteem just gets destroyed. But it's just, it's part of the process. But it is saying they want me. They want to know my story. And that's really what it's about. I love that. We're all unique individuals. Media want to hear from us. So that's a big mantra is they want me. Or there is, you know, media want to interview me. I'm, um, I'm a media expert. There are so many stories available for me. It's just like the abundance mantras, right? I feel like um, I am important. Yep. Yep. And there's also um, Michael Bernard Beckwith, who is, uh, he has the Agape Center in LA and he's, I don't know what you call him. He's a spiritual guru, whatever. He's amazing. Um, but he says, because there's the mind trick, right? So you should say to yourself, why, not just why am I so blessed? Why am I always so blessed because subconsciously you get the always and so it creates the consistency so why am i always so blessed with consistent flowing cash flow why am i always so blessed with amazing team members who deliver killer pr results for my clients why am i always so blessed with multitudes of media who want to interview me and so that literally creates the the trick in your subconscious because your thoughts create your reality right that's how you attract it comes to you your segues are just ace today uh, because I want to know how okay. does manifestation play into PR and publicity? This is your thing. Yeah. I mean, I wish I could say it was easier and there'd be like so many more mi miracles and I can make it rain. And maybe I am that powerful and I'm just afraid of my own power because I don't know what I'd do with it if I had all that power. Maybe I'm holding myself back. I think but, we probably all do at some level. I know. So true. It really layers is. Layers right? and layers so bad and every time you book what's that book uh the upper limit that every time you get to one layer you hit the yeah. upper limit the big and leap by like, hendrix yes and it's like people like denise duffield thomas and even though she's a multi-millionaire many times over she says she still hits upper limits like it's never done but again being in the energy of belief i think that is the other one you actually have to believe it's going to happen and then it it's all the cliches. You need to let go of timelines. You have to believe it's going to happen. You also need to be in that energy. And I was listening to actually something to from Joe Dispenza this morning. And what was it that um, it's not a universe, it's a multiverse. And it just depends what frequency you are tuned into that you literally get to have a different reality. So if you're tuned into grumpy and this and feeling sorry for yourself and being a victim of your life, like this never happens for me. And I think to a certain degree, I've had that because um, not that I got second best, but I didn't get quite exactly what I dreamed of. I always got something a little bit different. So I think subconsciously, I've always been like, am I getting leftovers? Or is that what I get as second best? But then I started to realize that I'm actually not intentional. I'm not clear at all with the universe. You know, when I order from the universe's waitress, I'm not being specific that I want pickles on the side, or how I want my steak done, right? I'm like, I would like steak. Did I say that I wanted it delivered, you know, in a, in a five-star restaurant on a beautiful silver platter? Like I'm not. So then of course I'm going to get a steak of any kind. So if any of this is making sense, it's really about the specific specificity and clarity of it. And then just believing it's going to happen. And so going back to your point about like, how do you actually manifest coverage is that you believe it's going to happen. You, you know, the, the universe puts your desires in your head. You wouldn't be thinking about this stuff or wanting this stuff if the universe didn't place it in your head. 
It's your job to be in the highest, best vibration. And you can't be in that vibration for 24 hours a day. It's impossible. I wish it was possible. Of course, there's going to be shit and negative thoughts and whatever. But when you realize it, take a step back, deal with your like shitty emotion that's going on, get back into that uh, tune, that vibration, whatever it is that you want to be tuned into, and then start to go back to it and create and believe from there, right? It's literally just about stepping into a different, different energy and where you can create from. Again, it sounds a lot easier than it actually is. Um, but I do believe in it. And I think this is a lot of the ways that we're talking about, like women want to do differently. Women want to create differently. We don't want to hustle. We don't want to, um, we don't want to have to push and chase for everything. And I think this is going back to our divine desire to be fully open and embodied women, I guess, with the powers that we've always had. And we're told that we couldn't. I mean, divine feminine energy is about surrender, right? Mm, my gosh, that word. <laughs> so, I know, I know, right? So, so much of what you said there, like manifestation is, it's like, it's like you said, putting your order out there and then surrendering. And obviously that doesn't mean, you know, hang out in bed all day and wait for the silver platter to come mm -hmm. to you, but it means to surrender to how exactly what that might, mm -hmm. or when that might happen, or if it might look slightly different than what you initially envisioned, but that surrender piece. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe, and I, I really believe, I'm sure you're the same, that women, we should lean more into our divine feminine energy. I think it would truly change the world. And I think, you know, you, you said, you're like, what do we call this time right now? I've heard it referred to as the great awakening. And I really mm. love that because I feel like a lot of individuals are waking up to their, their own power um, and hopefully the beauty of their energy and their, but whether it's feminine or masculine or both their power. What do you think the world looks like? And maybe specifically from, yeah, the world and also PR and publicity. How do you think it's going to change when women bring our divine feminine energy? Yeah. Oh, I hope that it won't be a war of the sexes that women end up being completely misunderstood and it hurts us more than anything. I think that's one thing that I'm battling with is, is that if I choose the fully divine and feminine way, do I lose everything? Not that I've created everything in my life through in my life through hustle, but I have followed the nudges and chased things. So, for example, when I lived in the UK, I was like, I, I don't even know if I said I would love to work for a beer company, but I was I had beer experience doing Molson at my agency when I was in Canada before I moved to the UK, and I saw an ad for a beer company on the tube, and then I cold called the beer company, cold called the marketing director, and he said I'm looking for a secretary, and I said fine, I'll be your secretary if you let me do PR. Like that was a divine sign right in front of me. And then the next year I ended up becoming head of global PR. I had agencies all over the world. I was traveling the world. I was 26 years old traveling the world and marketing beer. Like it doesn't get better than this. And, you know, with my agency that I had as an entrepreneur, you're hustling, you're making things happen. So I know how to create from hustle or from doing. I don't know how to create through surrender. And that is terrifying. And there's a part of me that is so afraid to let go and to fully surrender because I think at the back of my mind, I'll end up poor and broken. Mm -hmm. But what if it could be the other side of it, right? What if it, and it can, you, you can tell in my language that I say, what if it could be the other side? I don't fully trust again, because we're in a man's world. And, and please, I think Lisa and I, you talk, and I talked about this. This discussion is not about hating on men. Absolutely not. You know, sacred masculine and you know, what men have created is absolutely amazing. But there comes a time when people want differently. And I think women want differently. But I, again, I feel like there's going to be such a misunderstood thing. Will women be called lazy? Do I feel lazy if I surrender? What is my version of taking aligned action? Do I need to continue to hustle through aligned action? Do I need to show that I'm hustling? Or can I sit here and wait for it to come and to receive it? Do I trust the universe to provide it to me? When I could ask somebody for a referral, as opposed to energetically putting it out there in order for that yes to come to me, there's a part of me that like my fingers are on that keyboard. I mean, not that I'm not asking for a referral, but there's some days that I'm just like, okay, I'm looking for this type of a client who's got it. And there's something about like, maybe you shouldn't be pressing send. And I mean, I, I do press send. And I, like I said, I work my network, 
But again, is that, am I working my network because I don't trust the universe to listen to my vibration and to provide Like it's, it's a whole different can of worms. I love that you brought this up because I think these are some really common, and these are things we're all going to have to navigate individually and collectively. Here's my sense and feel free to take it or leave it. But my sense is that feminine energy in its office is also very much about community collaboration, um, enoughness. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think that it's necessarily about not doing or not, or not hustling, but it's about what you said there, which in terms of like, like an inspired, inspired insight or divine mm -hmm. guidance and then aligned action. And to me, when you said like reaching out to my network, I'm like, there's nothing more feminine energy than reaching out to your mm -hmm. network. That's community. That's collaboration. That's the yeah. spirit of there's enough for you. There's enough for me. We can share, we can help each other and we all rise up together. That to me mm -hmm. is what the feminine energy is, is the, the masculine is that com is more competitive, right? The feminine mm. is about collaboration and everybody rising up together. So, you know, and, and I think all the things that you said are very, very fair questions, concerns. Um, they're, they're things that we probably all think because I think it's been ingrained in us. That's what, that's what the patriarchy mm -hmm. is. It's mm -hmm. only valuing in the masculine side and, and sometimes mm -hmm. too far to the toxic side and not valuing the, the value of women. So the questions that you just asked are exactly what we have to, we're going to work together to overcome and to mm -hmm. see those value. And, and I also just don't, I don't think it's about just sitting there waiting for it to come. I think it is about hearing the nudges, following the nudges, like what you just said there about that job, like bingo, you got it. You know, like that, that, you are doing it. That is exactly what it's about. It's not about just sitting on a mountaintop and waiting for it to happen mm. because you feel it. It is it is about seeing the stars align, whatever the way that is, yeah. or, or having a little spark and following it, following that feeling as opposed to following the 10-step process of what it's supposed to be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And if you can make it not a 10 step process and it's only two because you got your divine energy and inspiration and flow from there, you know, some, one of my coaches, as I was setting up my own coaching program, uh, I'm trying to remember, oh yes, it was a spiritual coach who told me is that the, what was it? The divine feminine is so needed right now. And one thing that you need to work on Almira is that you're not teaching these women to create and to hustle in the male environment and in a male way of business. And so when I thought about it, I was like, Oh my God, you're so right. Cause I'm teach women about like power standing up. Like it's a very masculine energy of things. And I teach corporate women, like as, as part of my mentoring or when I work with clients, I tend to actually mentor their teams. And so thinking about mentoring one of my clients team of, of girls, women, um, I was teaching them how to stand up for themselves in an assertive, not aggressive, but assertive manner and to make sure that they were being more vocal and how to operate in a man's world, which was my version of teaching women how to stand out. And I, I do still believe that it's necessary, but on the flip side, I need to make sure that I'm telling them to lean into their intuition, to lean into their feminine right? I need to bring that balance to it because otherwise I'm just going to create an, uh, an army of millennials who are essentially wearing shoulder pads, right? So that was well, a really interesting thing that she broke up, brought up. And to, I love that. And to build on it, I think, okay, so if we see feminine energy as kind and compassionate and open and surrendering, the toxic side of that, or when we have too much of that, it creates, it's a lack of boundaries, a lack of speaking up It's mm. the people pleasing. Yeah. So it's actually yeah. not necessarily, I mean, I don't know if it really matters whether it's necessarily feminine or masculine, but it's bringing, it is bringing that back into balance when you actually do have the confidence and courage to have boundaries or to say no, or to stand for what yeah. you believe in or to, and to not let other people decide your worthiness or what's right or what's wrong about you or any of those things and to just stand in your own confidence and courage. I think that is actually a lot of a lot of femininity. And th it is a balance that needs to happen because we have gone so far where women don't feel comfortable to stand up, where women do people please, where we don't necessarily hold boundaries, or we just go really far the other way and we become really angry. And that doesn't work either. But there's a way to stand in those healthy 
beautiful boundaries and confidence in a way that feels aligned and feels really divine to us that doesn't mm-hmm. need to be toxic the other way either. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Totally. It's funny as you talk about the whole people pleaser thing that now being a working mother, like the world is not for working mothers or working parents, frankly. No, you know, the school system, not. I don't even understand how getting off at three o'clock when work ends at five o'clock. But most of it's affected women by virtue of the fact that they have made less money or, you know, you're the one breastfeeding in a home and you're taking them out leave. And so in order to keep their jobs, working women had to people please and juggle it. So now it's turned into this culture of burnout and juggling and whatever it might be. And so that all came through people pleasing. Crazy. Absolutely crazy Mm -hmm. that we did this to ourselves. We didn't have a choice, but we did it to ourselves in order to keep the peace or in order to maintain the patriarchal systems. Like it's like literally we've led to our own burnout. Really? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess we kind of did. Yeah. Yeah, that's what happens. Lack of, yeah, lack of boundary, lack of, a, and a lot of that is structural, systemic. There's so much in yeah. there. Um, very. Yeah, I love that. Okay, so how are you integrating more feminine energy into your life? Because I, I, anyone listening to you, like you're so inspiring, so fierce, and I feel like you said, you've done a lot of hustle, but what are you doing in your life to have more feminine energy? And what might other people listening yeah. that are like, oh, okay, I feel like I could have more divine feminine energy as opposed to perhaps um, too much talk, uh, too much masculine, or perhaps too much feminine. Well, how do you how do you integrate the divine feminine? Mm-hmm. For me, um, it, it's funny because I've promised myself I'm taking like a few weeks to rest, so I haven't actually been doing this lately. But normally, I like to just get up earlier than everyone else in the morning. So wait, wait, wait. Can we, can we just talk about that you like you're taking a few weeks off to rest here we go yeah. there is the feminine right there yes totally okay. actually it's funny honor I was that. To my energy yes i was talking to my energy healer and apparently a whole bunch of women like every woman she's talked to has taken august off yes i know so many women amazing. too yes yeah yeah yes. okay i sorry i didn't mean to interrupt i just wanted to, I just to honor that because i think that's a really big deal yes. that even that is yes. is feminine time to rest yeah yeah there's actually um Oh, what's her name? I think her name is Monique McDonald, if I'm not mistaken. And she talks about the cycles, that it is essentially the busy, the chaos, and then the third cycle or fourth cycle ends up being rest. And we absolutely need to honor from rest. But funny enough, rest actually ends up being busy time, right? Um, So I will, and like I said, I would normally get up earlier than everybody have my coffee. But lately, I've just been like chilling in bed. I'll set my alarm for 630. I'm like chilling in bed. I feel like I'm sleeping in before the day gets on with it. But otherwise, I do like to get up and meditate, um, taking that moment just to ground. And then I've been working on some practices lately where I start defining and journaling my future and my, my dreams. I shouldn't say my future, but my dreams and being really, really crystal clear about what it is that I want. So when I talked about being really intentional, because I felt like I was ordering from the universe's waitress, but I was doing a really poor job of actually ordering. And because I, I think I was just always surrendering it like, oh, this is what I want universe. Yeah, but I have the universe supposed to want to deliver anything to me when I'm not clear, right? And which is humorous for me because I really am the most clear person. You know, I'm very clear. I've I've had leadership coaches and communication coaches to teach me how to be a better listener and a better leader. So I guess the humor is is that I couldn't really lead the the manifestation of my dreams in life how I wanted it. Again, there's I mean it's it's polarity, right? But um, I'm, I'm just doing less running around, you know, and it's just like before I'd be like, oh, it's fine. I can go get the groceries and stuff I'm like, no, that is exactly what save on cart is for. Right. I'm just I'm, I'm at home or I'm reading. Um, and then in the evenings, um, right after bedtime, I sit down and I meditate. And again, I'm writing my dreams. Um, I, there's a lot of coaching programs. I realize I'm one of those people that buy coaching programs and I never get time to finish it. And I'm just listening. You know, I'm just, I'm sitting outside. I'm having a cup of tea. I'm listening and learning. I shouldn't say that I'm fully off because I do have a couple of clients. Um, but on the whole, I'm just taking it quieter. You know, I don't really want to see people um, or I'm just being very specific. Uh, uh, very intentional about who I want to see because I'm just taking some quiet time for me and to listen to me. I walk a lot. Um, this morning I, I rode my bike. I will go to the beach, grab a coffee, you know, I'll do my work and then I'll go to a beach and just grab a coffee, coffee and think. Um, I want to be really intentional about what the next 45 years look like, if you can ever plan that much, but I'm, I'm planting my seeds now, you know, and, and um, again, going back to my energy healer, she was saying like, you are so strong 
but weeds are resilient. You know, you think your resilience is so, so strong and it's amazing. And she says, oh, of course it is. But weeds are resilient. Do you want to be a weed? And I was like, oh. I want to live a more heart centered way. I think my heart is not in as much flow as it could be because I've spent so many years in entrepreneur hustle. I have tinnitus, which is ringing of the ears. I think it comes from a hustle hangover. Um, and now I have calcified tendonitis. Both of them are inflammatory issues. So my body is clearly inflamed. Um, I'm sure, you know, champagne and wine doesn't help. Um, but those are the fun parts, right? Um, but really um, spending a lot of time on my health has been a really big one because I'm, you know, I had my son at 40. I don't want him to have to take care of a mom, you know, and 40 is not old, but it's my body's not, and my health are not where I thought it would be. I want to be better with my health. So again, it's been taking that time of rest or integrating better practices, spending time on myself and just trusting that the universe is going to be providing the next stage of clients and business that I, I have put out there. Amazing. Okay. What about like moons, crystals, Mm, mm, totally water sounds or music like yes. tell me about because I, I believe you have some of those yes. kind of more yes. well, spiritual things as well that you incorporate yeah yeah so I think my biggest practice honestly has been stillness and you know as I, it sounds very hustle forcing myself to meditate but yeah there's the simple things I'm all about the hacks we're working women um so definitely in order to change the energy up in the house if we need it or if I need it like maybe before I've had a crazy day I just need to change my brain or I might feel like my tension is coming up when I'm around my son is that I put on uh, music the sounds of running water and the sounds of birds that energetically changes things or a scented candle um <coughs> excuse me where uh, literally all of these things have different vibrations. I don't understand enough about vibrations and frequency to actually talk about this stuff on a physical level and what it actually does. But literally, I mean, it also makes you happier. When you smell that candle, you're happier. It changes your vibration, but it also changes the vibration in the room. Um, starting new things or calling in new things with the new moon. And there have been some powerful moons lately, right? I don't know if anybody saw it, but it was the July new moon, the buck moon. I've never seen a moon like that in my entire life. Like it was massive and glowing gold. I'm still in awe of that moon. And apparently this past Thursday's full moon, uh, I think it was a pink moon, massive. So what happens on a new moon is, is that you write or call in what is it that you want to bring in. You also charge your crystals up, clean up that energy. And then on a full moon, it is what you are going to release. And, um, you know, what you're letting go of and could be business, emotions, whatever it is, toxic people. There's a lot of letting go of toxicity right now. Um, so just following the moon practices and our bodies are what 95% water or something like that. And especially women with our moon cycles, we are ruled by the moon. You can also know about like your moods and things like that, according to the moon cycles. And so, um, simple practices of changing the music or when I go have my shower in the evening, I have a candle. And so I just, um, shower by candlelight and have some really beautiful practices that are stepping more into that feminine. And also because it does clear out your subconscious. And like, I love a glass of wine at night, but then I think about it. And I think this is also part of aging is I think about the fact that I'm going to sleep with alcohol in my system and how that affects my brain. So that's been one practice. Like I love the feminine ritual of having a glass of wine. You know, maybe I might have a little, little charcuterie, you know, but then it's like literally the last thing going into my body before I go to sleep is alcohol. I think that's the one I'm struggling with. So I think I'm the queen of England. They say she is champagne before bed, right? I mean, she's lived till 90 something. But again, I think about the health practices behind it. And I was like, I probably shouldn't do that. You know, I, I want to live differently. I want to have different practices in my life. One of the things I'm really appreciating about this conversation is your honesty, transparency, and just your realness. So like, really, truly, cool. thank, you thank you for that. I love hearing the things that you feel like you are nailing and doing great in, and also the ones that you're still our practice. I think that's so important to share. So thank you. I know everybody listening to really resonate and relate to that. Okay. There's a few last, we're going to switch back to tactical yes. for a few minutes. Um, rapid fire questions that I have for you on PR. And then we're going to wrap up with our golden girls, rapid fire questions that you don't know about. Okay. Okay, so tactical rapid fire PR questions. What are your thoughts on services like Haro or Quoted? 
Mm -hmm. It was funny, again, because you and I were talking about this, and you said you've actually gotten great coverage out of it. So for those of you who don't know what HARO is, it's H-A-R-O, Help a Reporter Out. And there is a free version and the premium version that you can pay for. I've never had success with those. Uh, for our clients, and I know a lot of other publicists have not had success, but it's interesting. And one, I think obviously you're amazing because you're a female coach who talks about finance. And it makes me wonder is, if Haro is better suited for somebody in your industry rather than my clients. Because I was thinking about it and I was like, well, of course the publications that you are getting want to hear from a specific type of person. So maybe it's just that my clients really aren't the fit. And I mean, in Haro, they, they tell you what they're looking for. So my clients are not necessarily a fit. I might get something once a week, whereas in the categories that you're looking for is a better fit. Um, but by all means, if you can find something to help you and like you can get onto these things and get onto their list and then um, delete it, right? So get on there, see what the opportunities are. I mean, heck, if it's something that's coming to you, asking for you to say yes, well, absolutely, look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. I mean, for anybody who's listening and wants to do some more take action, which is what we want. We want you to implement things here. Surrender and implement both of those things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's a really great one that you could do too. That's, in my opinion, for myself, it, it's felt less intimidating than reaching out to a reporter who I don't know, who doesn't know me. I like the the Haro idea because they're like, I'm looking for this. And I can just kind of put my hand up and say, yes. And we need more women. We want more women to put their hands up and say, I'm important. You need to hear it. Talk to me. You need to hear, listen to me. So um, yeah, hopefully that's, I guess it's, it works for some, doesn't work for others, but it's something to try, I think. Uh, okay, a common criticism I have heard, um, PR doesn't generate revenue. And you you talked about that. You, you said you can't make the correct connection between PR and the sale. And especially in a time of budget crunching, all that, it might be the first thing to get cut or it might be something that women don't necessarily invest in for themselves. What would you define? What's your response to that criticism? What do you see as the ROI of PR? somebody else is going to get it. Why not you? And if you have a belief in your expertise and wanting to get out there, it's, it's not up for discussion as far as I'm concerned. And so my coaching program that I teach on, it's actually combined on business and growing and scaling your business and your visibility. Cause I actually truly believe they go hand in hand. As you get more visible, you get to charge more money. As you get more visible, you have more credibility. You get the bigger clients, you get to charge more money, right? It's really, really simple. One follows the other. And, you know, if you are having, I don't know, a financial crunch and you get PR, yeah, it's probably not going to solve your problems. But if you have a whole bunch of PR of talking about your success, the bank is probably, I mean, unless your books are a mess, obviously, and you really don't have more money, that's going to be goodwill in the bank for the bank when you ask for a loan, because they'll be able to look you up. And again, it can't just be like fake PR about all of your stories. Um, or if you go onto something like Dragon's Den, for example, right? It, those are the deals with the sharks. Sometimes it's about money. Sometimes it's about the collaboration between which shark you get. But for whatever it is, if you've had some PR, they're much more interested in you. I mean, you've seen it when you look at um, Shark Tank and Dragon's Den. It's like, oh, you've had this? Please, I want to talk to you. So it is one of the necessary things. And if you think that like, because there are some women who are like, oh my gosh, I would never want the media to know about me. Or like, what if it's an invasion of my privacy or things like that? Like you, to a certain degree, you can control it and manage it. Uh, you might need to get somebody to help you in a time of crisis, but you, by you saying no or not giving the time, I, I just, I believe it's our responsibility and you have to do this. And I know that sounds like very judgy or, um, very pushy, but I do think that we all have a responsibility as women to get ourselves more and more visible. And I noticed actually that when I was in the UK, there was a whole of like tons of South Asian people in the media. You know, these two guys who are amazing DJs ended up on the 6 p.m. show on BBC, running the, the music show for BBC radio. And so they were starting to be more brown faces. And now I think the same thing is happening in Canada. So if that brown face can see more brown faces on TV. Where are they going to do? What are they going to do? What careers are they going to have? How are they going to make it more visible? And it also comes back to racism in our society. When we see people of different cultures and different skin colors and different abilities being out there and being visible, it's going to make that one kid say, I'm okay. You know, I grew up in a community where brown people had just started to move to. And again, even though I wasn't Punjabi, I still got bullied because I had brown skin. Humorously enough, my skin was too fair for my own community. So I got ostracized by all the kids in my own community. 
but you grow up with that and you carry such a stigma. And it's funny, I don't necessarily stand up for myself. And I've realized because I spent so much of my time just trying to hide because you just didn't want to get called names. And so within my own story about some days I'd be like, oh, I don't, do I want to put myself out there and whatever? And then I realized, well, it's because I just, I have this feeling that somebody's going to try and push me down. So it's my responsibility. Literally, it is my responsibility and it is my necessity to apply for that award, to be a finalist, to win it, to show people what's possible, to make our world more compassionate, more accepting, because right now we're seeing that the world, (laughs) depending on your perspective, isn't a very nice place, right? Look at all the shit happening. So if we can help on one side of it, then it's our responsibility to do it. It's just, for me, it's that simple. Mm, mm, So good. Okay. What, I know you've talked about paid media. When is it worth it? What should you consider? Yeah. What, what do you think if, if you, I get these, I get DMS all the time being like, be on the top 10 list of coaches and top entrepreneurs and all these things. Um, yeah. What do you, what do you see as valuable paid media and which ones are not? Yeah. Most of the ones that you get Instagrammed about aren't, but some of them, when, there's been a couple ones that clients have been like, I think it was a thousand dollars for them. And it was like top 10 technology company in the healthcare sector. It's like for a thousand dollars, do it seriously, because then you actually get to add it to your bio. So the PR value of it, even though it's really not a top publication, but it also connects to your SEO, to your Google, to your search, because it's all a marketing mix, right? And so when you um, have a piece of content that goes out or a blog post and Google spiders are looking for your updates so it can increase your Google uh, ranking, it all goes back down to it. So again, if it's $1,000, I would 100% do it. I mean, so long as it's good, don't get me wrong. But one of my favorite publications to do paid editorial is actually BC Business. They tell a great story and everybody's still reading. And I think I also had to get over myself because somebody had said, well, even though it says that it's sponsored, people are still reading it. So what's your problem? Like, stop being so highfalutin about it and like all PR snob. People are still reading it. So what's your problem? And then I go over myself, really. But the writers, they're phenomenal. They write great stories. And then what I do is, is that when I do a paid piece, I get the writers to interview my clients. So it's written in journalistic style. I would never get my client to write the piece and then submit it because it's not in journalistic style. It's probably super self-serving or it's just not well written in that journalistic style. Um, paid radio interviews can be really good because they're going to get pushed out or they're going to be on the radio station's uh, website. Paid podcast, depending on the price, um, I would really be looking at the, the shareability of it, how many listeners they have, how many people are on their newsletter database. So make sure you're always checking the analytics before you do anything paid. Always check the analytics. You know, I had one location that was like, oh, we're going to give you the bonus of our YouTube channel. And like, it was a whole shopping list of everything you got. And at first glance, like, this is amazing. Yeah. But then we looked on the YouTube site and they had 43 followers and six views on a video. That is not worth it, right? So you want to be checking into the behind the scenes of it. And then if you're buying something that will live digitally, make sure that you give them a UTM, the individual tracking code, so you can actually track the traffic back from that story to your own website because you want to give them a link that goes back to your own website so you can do that. And I actually had one client who heat mapped. So what was it? It was on their website and they could track back the uh, traffic that they got from the the technology newsletter that they were in. And you can, you can do all this fancy stuff. I'm not a techie, but the trackability of all of the PR behind it. And so, yeah, does it make it worth it to do a paid story then? Absolutely. Love it. Very cool. And you answered, well, I was curious about, you know, because when I see someone that's then won the top 10 coaches on Yahoo and I'm like, I know you paid for that. Sometimes I look at that and I'm a little bit skeptical, but you kind of answered that question as far as, um, you know, people are reading it. That's what's important. Right. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, and especially in times of a recession, I just wanted to add that, mm-hmm. that during a recession, people are going to cut, cut back on their marketing budgets. Right. But what's the one thing that's not going to change is that people are still going to be consuming content. People need to read content. So if it's good content and it's a good price, again, I wouldn't expect to get, I shouldn't say that. I may not expect to get tons of sales out of it, but maybe there's a partnership out of it. You know, I got actually got one client into earned media and I told her from the outset, I was like, PR is not going to sell your product. It's not going to happen. And I was like, I don't want to do this. And she's just like, Oh, Mira, I just, you're such an amazing publicist. Will you please do this? So I was like, okay, but I just want you to know this. This is not going to sell any of your product. 
Well, a store in New York saw her product through the publication that we got it in and called and asked for a brand partnership for a pop-up store for her. And so she was like, I'm sorry, PR doesn't sell your product. I was like, this is an exception. Mostly because I just, I, I'm all about being straight up front with people, right? You may not see detraction from it in terms of the sales, but you would, you would see it in the brand awareness, people recognizing you or whatever it might be, right? So then again, it becomes worth it as part of your, your larger marketing mix. What a cool story. That's really amazing. What yeah, is, it was. And I don't know if my language on this is correct, so feel free to correct me. What's the difference between warm pitching and cold pitching? Mm -hmm. So cold pitching would be if you or a PR person was to reach out to a journalist that you don't know and do a pitch. And warm pitching is typically when it is a publicist, or I, I use the example of a publicist who already knows that reporter and be like, hey, this is the new client I have. So for example, if you're a tech PR agency, you're going to know all the tech media. But in that case, it would be cold because it would be for a new client, right? But, um, or you're just reaching out to uh, journalists who are completely cold, no relationship. If you're hiring a publicist, it's their job to know the media, but they're not going to know every single media. And especially like they're not going to know every single podcast producer out there. There's too many podcasts in the world. So don't expect that everybody has those contacts. Part of our job as publicists is to make those relationships with the media to, and always be finding and researching, seeing who's talking about this. Or even one of the tactics that we use is called newsjacking. And we will find a topic or trend and then literally make a list of which journalists are covering that, covering that. And if our client can speak to that topic or issue, or if it's relevant, we cold reach out to that journalist because we've never dealt with them before. And we're going to say, our client has a similar story, whatever, but this is how they dealt with it. Or this is what they could speak to. I know you're running these types of tech stories. I've got this expert and we paint that picture in our uh, email pitch. And so that's the cold part. There's no relationship with them. But it's not a bad thing. I mean, you know, people like cold reach out for whatever reason you might need. Cold is not a bad thing, but you also, you know, um, if you can find somebody's full email address, for example, not just at, uh, you know, like department at cbc.com, but you actually find the journalist's name, it'd be like, hi, Lisa, I hope you're having a great day. Really love reading. Like that, warm up your pitch, warm up your cold pitch, right? Be a human being when you do a cold pitch. Mm -hmm. Great advice. Oh, and don't be, don't be CC journalists. Do not spam your pitch, you know, like put everybody in your BCC and spam them. That will get you blocked and actually probably just end up in the spam, um, in their spam box. Personalize every pitch, right? Mm hmm. Yeah. Love it. Great advice. Okay. Last two PR rapid fire questions. How much time should someone dedicate to PR? Oh, honestly, if you're super busy, I would do five pitches a month. And those could be five different pitches, uh, sorry, five different journalists, or it could be like taking the time in advance to think about like, okay, this is my campaign. And so maybe you are a dog store, pet store, <coughs> excuse me. And there is, first of all, it's national pet month in January. So probably about November, I would start pitching just because actually, no, I would be pitching sooner because I would pitch in September or October because I want to get that story about the best Christmas gifts for your dog. And then I would have the five journalists who cover pet stuff. I don't think any of this exists. I'm literally making this up right now. So not to give anybody a hope out there, but maybe there's a pet blog or a pet podcast. I don't know. But you want to plan in advance to look at your seasons and what they're going to be covering and also recognizing that media will work in advance of something, right? And so you could say, you know what? These are my five target publications. These are the journalists who cover these topics, or I've seen this journalist who's covered it once. That still makes it valid. And you could come up with your campaigns. And when I say campaign, it's just simple ideas and topics that you could speak to where that are relevant. In the case of your pet store, you would be looking at Christmas gifts for your pet, and then maybe it's Valentine gifts for your pet. And then, of course, you'd want to pitch somebody for National Pet Day. Maybe you could do special cookie treats for National Pet Day, right? So something that's interesting to talk about. And you would do five pitches a month and for those same journalists. Or you could say, I'm going to pitch five different journalists every month. But the thing is, is that you would never want to let somebody go six months because you literally wasted your pitch effort, right? So you pitch somebody in December and they don't hear from you till July. You've wasted the opportunity to warm them up. So my recommended way to do it would be to do your five continual ones with relevant stories that they would actually care about every month and then two new ones. And then just continue to add two new ones every month. And I know it sounds like it's a lot of work or it's just like a lot of multitasking, but that's probably the way that I would do it for somebody that that's, yeah, that's what I recommend for somebody who just does not have a lot of time. It does mean that you're having to research 
or to find, you know, who's writing about these stories. But you can also set up like Google alerts on your competitors so you can see what coverage they're getting. That's super easy. And then pitch those reporters or you can get a VA to be able to help support you. Right. There's there's lots of ways and there's a lot of support out there now that women need to be leaning into for help because you cannot work 48 hours in a day. There isn't 48 hours in a day. Brilliant. Such good advice. Love this. Okay. Last PR related question. What is the biggest misconception people have about PR? That it's all fun and fluff. I think ab fab, everybody's like, do you just drink champagne all the time? And I'm like, no, I work really hard. You know, I started doing crisis PR at my first agency. So one summer we had TransLink on strike and in theory, you would do a press conference or something like near a, a bus stop. But of course, it, it, you know, you're like, well, what the union decides to show up or do something. And then you cannot do a press conference about a unionized issue at a unionized hotel because that's crossing the picket line for the union workers. And then Purdy's went on strike and their union members belong to um, the same union as the journalists uh, union. So we couldn't even get stories. Then uh, Best Buy bought Future Shops and I got 72 hours notice to pull off that press conference. And that, that again, this is how old I am or how long I've been in the industry for. But we were doing satellite interviews with um, the CEO of Best Buy from Vancouver. And they're like, now we just do everything with Zoom. Back then, we I literally had to get tel TELUS to uh, like uh, cyber, what was it? Fiber optic um, line into the hotel, which actually was the first plan. But then we were like, this is insane. We do not have the time to get TELUS to lay fiber optic, even though they did agree. It was actually faster to get a satellite truck from Seattle to come up so we can do that interview. And a couple more things like that was my crisis PR summer, you know, and it was fascinating. And man, did I like I learned a lot. Um, but yeah, PR is not all fun and games. And you know, back then we had to wear pantyhose. And I think I developed a foot fungus because I was working all the time. And I was always in my pantyhose such weird times, right? Now I work from home in like shorts and a t-shirt. Um, but it's, yeah, it is, it can be so fun. And for me, that rush of seeing a piece like an interview, or I know when I've had my clients on your podcast, Lisa, like I'm pumped to get that interview, to score that interview. And I'm pumped when it comes out. For me, that's a thrill and a rush. Um, but you know, yeah, I do go to a lot of parties or at TIFF, I'm going to parties. So I think people like literally think I just drink champagne all day. And I'm like, I wish I drank champagne all day. So I think that that is the misconception is that we don't, you know, it's, it's all PR, darling. We'll actually do work really hard. Hmm. I, I see that. And I also, I love that rush too. It's so exciting. And I also love your yeah. guests. Or the people you pitched to my podcast are always great. And so it's pretty cool to have you here. It feels like a full circle moment. All right. Golden Girls podcast, rapid fire questions. You might know some of these because your clients have been asked them too. But I want to know, what is a goal that you're working on right now? I think it's expanding my reach. And I say this because I also have a coaching program, like I said, of PR and visibility. And I want to continue talking to more women and seeing where I can support. Um, and perhaps I've been very involved in my network. I'm not, I'm not good. Honestly, I, I'm an extroverted introvert. So the thought of having to reach out to people or just go like into different rooms or conversations and chat with strangers basically like makes me want to throw up. So I'm really just seeing it as I'm expanding my reach and I'm sharing my knowledge. That's why I'm positioning it as such. Um, slowing down, taking things off my to-do list. That has been such a big one. It is, it's not even necessary, but actually, you know, I shouldn't say that I'm actually taking them off my to-do list. I hired a VA. So somebody is doing it because I looked at my list and I was like, this is insane. I could work till December on all the stuff that I need to do. And it was just helping with some st more structure in my business. And then I was like, I'm going to hire somebody else to do this. And so that has been an interesting challenge to me because I joke about how at the end of the day, I just want to sit poolside and drink champagne. Again, everything goes back to champagne. But I think in my head, I needed to achieve something more before I could do that. And the getting my mind wrapped around taking rest. And again, it's so funny because I would, I tell everybody to delegate in my larger agency. I delegate it all the time, but there's some weird thing that I had about my consulting business that it wasn't big enough for me to bring in all of this help or hadn't achieved enough for me to have more time. It was so weird. And the moment I started hiring my team members, it was just like, you're crazy girl. 
ask for help, do all of those things that you need to. And of course, now I outsource everything. <laughs> Amazing. Such good wisdom. Yes. So good. Um, maybe this is the same thing you just shared. Or maybe it's a different, different lesson. But I want to know what is the best lesson you've learned in the last year? Oh, you are not your thoughts. And that just because you think something doesn't mean it's true. And again, talking about the state of consciousness or awakening that we're all in, I saw this meme or not meme. It was this graphic on Instagram the other day. And it said that the awakening is going mainstream. I'm like, how true is that? But when I see things like that, it reminds me that we're like, I mean, first of all, none of this actually exists. Um, and that whatever I think is not necessarily the, the the truth or I'm attached to thoughts. And I really had to challenge my perceptions about things and about what I thought or even about, I mean, here's a perfect example is that I finally read Rich Dad, Poor Dad this year. And being a child of immigrants, my parents were not in wealth creation mode or sorry, they weren't in cash creation. They were in saving their money and accumulating in order for stability in this new country and to ensure their kids had a successful future. So I said to my dad, I'm like, why didn't you just create cash in the stock market? And he was like, uh, we were occupied with more things, right? But my perception of how you create money and the stories that I had in my head were completely false. Absolutely false. Because you can literally create money. And there's a book that I read this year called Money Does Grow on Trees. It's true. Money literally grows on trees. And so that's when I've had to really challenge my perceptions about relationships, about life, about motherhood, which I like to think I hold no judgment because do whatever the fuck you want, Mama. Um, but taking that moment to step back and going through those challenges because my thoughts are what have created my world was certainly interesting. Mm, so good. So good. I feel like the answer to the next question is going to be everything. Um, but I want to know if there's one that kind of stands out to you. And the question is, what's something in your life that you've changed your mind about? They used to believe one thing and now you believe the opposite. Yeah, everything. Um, I think it would be about stillness and about letting things take their course. And I, I think because I'm a problem solver, I can fix anything. And I've realized sometimes it's not necessary to fix everything, that I can't problem solve my way through life. And the more I step back, aha, this was an interesting one as a woman, focusing on myself. So the more that I step back and focus on my joy, everything falls into place. Again, going back to surrender and the hard part, but I think also being a woman and a brown woman and saying, I'm just going to focus on myself like everything else. And obviously you know, my son, because he's four and can't do anything. Um, and that it was okay to do that. Mm. Giving myself permission to focus on me. That was huge. Again, intellectually, I know it, but internally it's like my body is screaming against mm. the stories and the expectations that again, like my parents wouldn't care. My community wouldn't care, but it was me that I carried it. The cultural programming that we unconsciously carry. Mm -hmm. I think you just gave a whole lot of us permission too. So thank you. Okay. Yes. Poutine. Are you a cheese curds or a shredded cheese girl? I don't know. I don't eat poutine. <gasps> oh my I'm gosh. a 99 right. cent pizza girl. Uh, if you find me on Granville street, I'm not that I'm not there. I'm at 99 cent pizza. Okay. All right. Well, you know what? You take me yeah. to your best 99 cent pizza and I'll take you to my favorite poutine. Done. Um, what Done. is the best money you've ever spent? On myself. What, is there a particular thing that you've spent that made you the yeah. happiest or the most relaxed or whatever that is? Coaching. And I think that, you know, a lot of people go through it and you talk to a lot of very successful coaches and they talk about how much money they spent on coaching and the level of debt that they acquired. <laughs> Not that I've done that, but it's the faith about the things that you want out of life, but honestly investing in myself. I never realized how many limiting beliefs I had and especially so much around uh, the color of my skin, my gender, uh, about what I could or couldn't do because I was a mom, man. And I think it was the, the, the C word. We don't want to say it, but we're going to say it COVID that gave me the chance to sit down after all of this time and really examine everything and truly understand what's holding me back. Like the past two years, I'll truly say eh, to a certain degree, it's been complete hell. 
I've unraveled everything and like cried and sobbed and let everything go what I believe to be true and what I believe to be true about my life. But it's true on the other side of fear is joy and freedom. I just, I don't know, maybe it comes with being 45. I just don't care. But um, I may mean, care about all of the most important things in my life, obviously, but the rest of it, eh, right? It's easier said than done, though. It is easier said than done. Yeah. And I think um, growth, you know, personal growth and getting rid of mindset, like kind of like PR, like it sounds like sexy, like you're reading some books, you're listening to some podcasts, you're, you know, yeah. climbing a mountain and doing some pretty journaling. But in my experience, it's like a really painful exfoliation and it's crying yes. it's it's pain it's shedding it's like it's an uncomfortable it's pushing yourself outside the comfort zone like that's where the real growth is the growth yes. it, it looks sexy sounds sexy maybe you have a sexy coach but the actual process of personal growth and spiritual growth as well is ugly and painful and yes. awful but also the most amazing transformation comes from that. Totally. Yeah. You know, Jody Spence, again, I was listening to one of his uh, programs, but it was like, and I think that finally made it be like, okay, this happens to everybody. But like, it is painful and physically painful and everything will be hard and hurt. And I to spoken to my spiritual coach and I was just like, I don't understand why growth has to be so painful. She says it's polarity. And also, how else are you supposed to grow? It's like, are you going to grow when you fall in love? Like, no. I'm like, but you can. But it's conflict or things like that that bring things out. And I think this is my, like, war with the universe is that I still completely disagree <laughs> that it should come through pain. It's like, freaking kidding me? Come on, man. Shouldn't be like this. It doesn't have to come through pain. I'm like, is this just the masculine way and we just need to have more feminine ways of growing? Um, I literally have this conversation with the universe when I just get annoyed and I'm sure the universe is probably just like, just, just stop, please just stop asking that question. Just surrender, but just yeah. surrender, Almira. Know, like, <laughs> just shut your mouth, stop being the kid who argues because you just argue with us all the time. But I mean, if, if you want a different way of life, like got to shake it down, but it's, it's, yeah, it's not what I thought it would be. Like I went doing, you know, I got a coach. I didn't think it would like shake my life up to the level that it has. Um, but it's, it is beautiful, right? I mean, we're having a spectacular August. I'm talking to you. Is mm -hmm. it really that bad? But to come on the other side of it, like, it is painful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, Amira, this has been amazing. Thank you so much oh, for God. everything You're amazing. you have shared. Um, I just, I love how you're so smart. You're such a, such a boss. You just know so, you have so much wisdom and great tactical strategies, ideas. And then also you brought this beautiful spiritual and also just your realness. I think it's been really powerful to hear, you. you know, not just what you want everybody to see in like terms of a shiny PR fabricated, polished image, but who you really are, what are the thoughts in your head, where, where you're really at in life. And I think that's been so inspiring and humbling for me as a person. And you've also, I know, inspired myself and probably so many others to put our hands up and go get excited to, to go get some PR, put ourselves out there and get visible. So thank you. Where can people thank find you? Thank you for having you? me. Oh, you're welcome. Before I say that, I just want to say how amazing you are. Like you've got this platform to have the most honest and real conversations. And aside from our friendship, the fact that you and I can just have this podcast conversation, like thank you for opening up your door to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. You are amazing. Everybody should be listening to Lisa and coaching with Lisa and like just all, all of the um, examples that you are setting. And I mean, particularly around wealth, because I just love everything that you and Troy are doing and the way that you're living life. And your big, big heart, I think, is so phenomenal. So thank you. Mm, thank you. I appreciate and that. You can find me on yeah. Instagram. Yes. Um, well, Lisa's going to tag me in the show notes and everything. So you can, I always say this because of my name, Almira Bardai. It's just like, well, what are my parents thinking? So, anyways, you can go through the show notes and find them when Lisa tags me. Otherwise, uh, A L M for mother, I R for Richard, A Almira B on Instagram. My website is www.almirabardi.com. And on there is actually a freebie with the top three ways to get free PR. Um, on Facebook, it's Almira Bardi. And then, yeah, through the show notes, we're connecting with Lisa. So please reach out. I would love to have a conversation. Slide into my DMs. Is that what the cool kids say? Yeah. Drop into my DMs. I don't know. I, I have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm not. I'm. Yeah. 
<laughs> uh, we're Somebody all going to be, be sliding into your like, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> We're all gonna be sliding into your DMs. I actually like set up and oh my god, I tried to set up a TikTok account. I couldn't figure that out, and I was like, "We're good." We don't need TikTok. I got locked out of TikTok last summer, like it's just a password thing, and it took me like six weeks to (laughs) to get back. I mean that, yeah. And then I'm just like, now I'm just angry at it, and I'm not going back. Um, I'll make sure I have all the links in the show notes for you. Uh, But if you do decide to join TikTok, we'll add that too. Um, and if you love this conversation, definitely go, go give Amira a follow, go connect with her, slide into her DMS and know that on Instagram, we're also going to be going live when this podcast episode goes live as well and talk a little bit deeper into the sisterhood wounds, some of Almira's failures at work, entrepreneurship wins and a successful business exit, what that looked like as well as motherhood. Cause we couldn't cram it all into one episode. So we're going to go live too. So make sure you check that out. Go, go give some love on Almira. Almira. I almost forgot to ask you, you alluded to it, but can you tell us more about your upcoming offering? Uh, You know, what's it called? Who's it for? Tell me more. Yeah. So excited to talk about this. This is my signature business scaling growth, whatever you want to call it, and visibility program. It's called Six Figure Media Queen. And originally, I started just talking about public relations and being visible. But as I started to do this, Of course, everybody kept asking the questions about how to grow and scale your business because I've done this. And, you know, when we talk about PR, sometimes we're just so bad at doing our own PR and talking about our achievements. I tend to be that woman, right? And so it was like, of course, I should be sharing all of what I've learned um, and and helping these incredible women. And not to say that the offering is just for women, it's for men as well. But of course, women are really leaning into each other, collaborating with each other and learning from each other. Uh, And particularly my case in visibility and public relations, so that they were asking for this because I've done it and want to have the learned experiences. I've really come to that point in my life that I'm like, why would you recreate the wheel and try and learn by yourself. It doesn't make any sense, you know, and especially in what is called, you know, a time obsessed or time crunch society that we're currently in. Like, why? why? (laughs) Again, it doesn't make any sense. Anyways, that's all to say that Six Figure Media Queen is for those women who are wanting to grow and scale their business to six figures and beyond, because I've taken my businesses to six figures and seven figures and multiple seven figures. Um, And then as well as the public relations and the visibility side of it. As I said previously, I do believe they go in hand in hand as you grow the business grows. And of course, you have to keep in mind it this has to be your intention. And there is And you have nothing to be apologetic about to say that, you know what, I actually want a smaller business that maybe I want to have a four figure business. I think we need to ignore all the noise out there about $10,000 a month and your six figure year and stuff like you don't have to want that. If you don't, don't feel bad. We, we all want different things in life, you know? Um, and of course, as we, we say that money is a fuel for your dream life. And again, not to condescend anybody who wants a life that is perhaps off grid where you don't necessarily need those six figures, although I'm sure off grid could be even more expensive, right? So that's all to say is, is that if this resonates with you, that you want to grow and scale your business to six and seven pick figures and beyond and understand about the simple, and I say simple because like, it, it's not hard, the simple and easy and inflow systems and structures to run your business, to run your team, to be a more effective leader. And of course, it also involves the energetics of expansion. We talk a lot about energy and getting into that mindset and that heart set. And then of course, with the visibility piece of it to learn how to do your own public relations. You learn about positioning, how the media works, how to actually pitch media. There's one section which um, which, which is about how to write the media pitch because there's an art to writing that pitch to the media. There is an art to finding the right reporter. There's an art to nailing down that visibility. And going back to how we talked about awards, there's an art to writing specific um, uh, nominations and submissions for awards. So it sounds like it's a very packed program, which it is, but my belief is always about ease, grace, and flow. So I teach in ease, grace, and flow to show you how you can grow and scale your business with ease, grace, and flow. You know, I've done the blood, sweat, and tears. (laughs) Don't do it. (laughs) Let me help you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, And let me teach you how to get that visibility that you know you've always wanted. You know, if you have that yearning inside you to be able to grow, to be able to be more visible, that's exactly why I created the program, really to be in service. And on my agency side, actually, all of my clients are men. 
And they just want to hand everything off to somebody. And I joke that I just basically boss them around. I'm the puppeteer. I pull all the brand strings, the PR strings. And I'm really, really passionate about seeing women get to that same level of getting into those leadership positions, either in the C-suite or in their own businesses to eventually, if they want to be able to hire a publicist or a marketing person to be able to do it for them or to grow their business. Uh, you know, we talked about previously when we were preparing for the podcast about um, feminine leadership. And feminine leadership is so needed in our world. And this beautiful energy of women's empowerment, how, you know, having these containers and these offerings where we weave it into it, and we, we unpack it, and we're able to bring it to the world consciously through our businesses, that's just only going to help us all raise up. So it's a very long answer to what this is and the why of doing it. I'm so passionate about helping women rise and to be able to move into those higher tax brackets or to be able literally to be able to change the world, you know, change yourself, change your family, change your community, change the world. And that hugely resonates with me. Beautiful. And all with ease, grace and flow. No more blood sweat. Exactly. Uh, nope. So how long does it go for and when does it start? Yeah, so it's going to start the third week of September, and it's a six-week program. And I'm running this one live because I love the live element of when you get women into a room and you collaborate and you brainstorm together. So it's 75 minutes per session. First half is me teaching on a specific subject, be it about business structures or team or leadership, PR, whatever it might be. And then the second half of it is actually using, I guess, hot seat coaching, if you will, that jumping in, everybody collaborating, throwing together ide together ideas. You know, when I had my PR agency, I had a business partner, Lindsay, and we, and this was actually because we were virtual before we, the days of being remote was cool. So basically we were visionaries, um, but we talked 37 times a day. Because I would have an idea, but I knew that my idea when I talked to her would get into third space. And that third space was so powerful, so potent, so genius. So it came to the point that I didn't even want to make a decision until I'd spoken to her. And this is what I find you get to this incredible third space when you get these collaborative sessions with women. The richness of the conversations and the tribe and the bonds that come out of it when you get these groups together is, I mean, that's almost as powerful as the coaching itself. You know, if you're here for expansion and to seeing other women expand and sharing your ideas to help them expand, and sometimes we see more of other people's genius than our own. So let these women see your genius, give you all the amazing ideas that sometimes you might just be hitting a wall with, right? It's wonderful to be able to do things in groups. And yes, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching as well, but there's, for me, there's nothing like the group experience. I just, I love the collaboration. I love the energy. Oh my gosh. I totally agree. Um, yeah, absolutely. There's, there's power to that. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. And we will add all the links to find out more about six figure media yes. queen in the show notes. So go check that out. September 19th, it kicks off. Um, and we'll also link to your Facebook group because I know that goes on year round in case you miss yes. out on this group. Yes, it is. And there's weekly lives in there uh, every Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific. Um, so just lots of sharing in there today. There was a post about business and energetics and your relationship with your business, uh, because there's a lot of energy and, um, I would say to a degree bullying of our businesses in the, our verbal language, like, you know, just the days you're venting, you're like, I hate my business. I don't want this anymore. Well, how does your business feel? Does it want to provide for you? So that was today's post was talking about the energy behind business and how we really, with our words, have the power to transform our reality. So cool. All right. Make sure everyone check that out. Check out Six Figure Media Queen, the Facebook group, and the Amira's upcoming offering. Yeah. Thank you. I speak for both of us. I, I hope you're okay with this, Amira. But if you, when you get publicity from listening to this episode, please tell us. We would love to see your face and share it out and celebrate you and, and just continue to, um, to allow your voice your expertise to be shared and to inspire others. So let us know where you've been featured and we will, can't wait to share. Love it. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Almira. Go enjoy some champagne and we'll thank see you, you soon. Oh my God. Love it. Okay. I'm so fired up after this episode. Full confession, public relations is actually one of the things I really enjoy in my business, but hearing Almira's strategies and tips has made me even more excited to implement and take action in my business and with my personal brand. 
Whether you're a professional or corporate employee, an influencer, a coach, an entrepreneur, your story matters. I hope you're also feeling inspired to take action and go get visible. And remember this, while I deeply appreciate you listening, thank you, seriously, most of all, I really hope you implement. I hope you take our invitation and apply for two awards in the next 12 months and let me know because we'd love to vote for you. I hope that you take Elmira's invitation and suggestion to carve out one afternoon or evening a month and submit five pitches every month. Start now. Plant your PR and media seeds today. Work on building your brand awareness and know that you'll also be inspiring many women out there to do the same. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for implementing and go ahead and share this with a friend you think also deserves to get their story out there. Don't forget to share your successes with us. We would love to celebrate and share. So when you do get some PR and media, make sure to tag us on social media and let us know so we can celebrate and share with you. All right, Golden Girl, thank you for listening. Go be powerful. Go be confident, important, beautiful you. Thank you so much for listening. If something spoke to you, send me a message by sharing this episode and tagging me on social media. If you know someone who would love to hear this episode, please share it with them too. Because I love surprises, make sure you subscribe to the Golden Girls podcast today. It's the only way to find out about bonus surprise episodes and make sure you don't miss a single beat on your golden journey. Thanks again for listening and I will talk to you in the next episode of the Golden Girls podcast.